Dean Collins, do I have your permission to record this conversation? Yes, you do. All right. All right, we're about to get started. Oh, and, and by the way, uh, obviously it's pre-recorded, so I edited it up a little bit. So if we ever make a mistake or, you know, I get a chance to clean that up and we can okay. re-ask a question or anything like that, so. Okay, very good. Okay. <clears throat> this is... <laughs> I'm having fun doing this, believe me. I'm You're right. Having a blast doing this. this is a blast <laughs> to me. What's going on? This is your man, Big Stu, Scott Stewart or Professor Stewart, depending on how you know me. And we are back for another edition of Dope People, the Dope People podcast. And I am super excited as I am in every episode, but it seems like the excitement just increases every episode. I am super excited to have with us the infamous Dean Derek Collins. Welcome, Dean Collins, to Dope People. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, before we let loose, we got to do a little, little house cleaning. Yes. Uh, for those who are new to Dope People in this podcast, this podcast is designed to talk to people who are at the highest level of education and educational leadership, right? These are the people within my network who I have stamped as absolutely dope. They're amazing people doing amazing things. Derek Collins serves as the Dean for the College of Business at the Chicago State University. Uh, previous to being at Chicago State, uh, Mr. Collins, Dean Collins, Derek Collins was the Assistant Clinical Professor of Finance at Northwestern University's JL Catalog, uh, Kellogg School of Management. <laughs> and right at uh, Kellogg, Dean Collins taught venture capital and private equity investing, as well as entrepreneurial finance. Now, I've known Dean Collins for a number of years. He eats, eats, sleeps, and breathes this content. <laughs> Prior to being in academia, Dean Collins worked as a venture capitalist and a bank commercial loan officer. And I don't have to state the obvious. It's obvious here. This is a black man. Black man doing this work. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Dean Collins. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yes. So every episode, in order, before we dig into the real meat of the conversation, we let the people get to know you by playing a friendly game of this or that. Okay. Are you down for a game of this or that? Let's go with it. Okay. All right. In the beginning, it's going to be real simple, and then we're going to ease into it. All okay. right. So, um, Spotify or Apple Music? Spotify. Okay. And you'll have an opportunity if you want to explain why on any of these, you'll have the chance to do that. Uh, deep dish or thin crust? Oh, thin. Oh. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. MJ or LeBron? Whoa, I got to go with MJ. Okay. You know, maybe it's a generational <laughs> thing. MJ. <laughs> MJ. Me and my son, we argue about it all the time. Okay. All right. That's a good one. City or suburbs? Whoa, I live in the suburbs, man, but... That's a tough one. I, I don't, whew, I live in the suburbs, but I, I, I love the city. That's, Something that's, that's about the city, right? Something so about what? the city, right? Something, Something about, about the, the city. Absolutely. It's the energy. The energy of the city is just infectious. Okay. Chicago winters or Chicago summers? Oh my goodness, man. <laughs> that's a question? <laughs> Chicago summers all day long. Well, I love a good Chicago winter as well. I'm, I was uh, driving out today and it was just like, it's already the end of November. There is no snow. It's jacket weather outside. So I, I, I but I do appreciate a good I, I, Chicago I think they have summer. terms for people like you called masochists, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll eat that. I'll eat that. A good paperback book or audiobook? Oh, paperback. Okay. All right. We're about to dig in a little bit. 
two year or four year college? Um, I preference is the four year college, not just because I'm at a four year college, but I think that the the four year college provides that 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 continuity uh, for a student to go all the way through. Uh, however, there are situations where the two year makes sense for students, and and it makes sense for a lot of people to do two year first. Um, uh, but if there's a preference, I would say that if there's a choice, a true choice, I would say the four years the better path. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. We're about to dig in a little bit more. The entrepreneur or the employee? Well, again, there's no preference there because I think that the entrepreneur, I think those are two different things and everyone is not set up to be uh, an entrepreneur, right? I, I would venture to say that most people are not prepared or set up to be an entrepreneur. And so most people should be employees. However, there's that there's that there's that 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 soul of an entrepreneur that's different. And entrepreneurs recognize that, right? Uh, while they're in it, they'll tell you this, this is not for everyone. Uh, but uh because they bring a special thing to the table uh and they are in the minority. Uh so I can't I don't have a, a preference for either one. It's just those are two different types of people. Well, let's, look, we got to get an answer, and I I respect your answer because yeah, you did yeah. give an answer. But in right, this right. game, I, I, be open, mm -hmm. and, you know, which one do you like cheer for the most? If I if I had to choose and cheer for, I'm gonna cheer for that entrepreneur because that okay, that's, that's, right. that's, that's that's one of the hardest things in the world to do. And if you can do that, it's like being a uh, NFL quarterback. If you can do that, you're just special. Awesome, awesome. All right, this is what this is the creme de la creme right here. PWI or HBCU? HBCU. I went to an HBCU as an undergrad. I uh, went to Prairie View a &M University. I'm originally from Texas. And there is a host in history, a host of things in a historical perspective that makes HBCUs very, very, very special. And it has served a purpose over the years, continues to serve a strong purpose. And so, um, that is something that I'll never be able to get away from. The HBCU is just a special place all across the, uh, the nation, most in the South, but all across the nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for surviving a game around of this or <laughs> that. Good job. Good job. Good job. Hats off to you. So let's talk about that a little bit. You, uh, you're from Texas, but, uh, yes. how, you know, well, the, the question is, what kind of student were you in elementary school, middle school, high school? What kind of student were you? I was, I was, in this, I was a pretty good student. And, and I was a pretty good student because my parents, both of them, which were ed educators, would not allow myself or uh, any of my three brothers to be anything less than a good student. That was not an option. <laughs> it was not an option in that household. So uh, I was a pretty good student. Uh, I, was, I remember in elementary school, to your point, of, of uh, students telling me, different kids, friends of mine telling me that they would, things that they would get if they brought home A's or what have you. And we never got rewards, if you will, for A's. You know, we would get questions if it was a B <laughs> or low. That you get questions, but you never, never received a, a special reward. It was just expected. And that transferred over into your college. So, yes. you know, I've known you again. I've known you for a number of years. You seem to be, you, you know, your disposition is very serious. You have an extreme high level of expectations. Your standards are very, very high. Is that accurate? Are, are you a very serious person? Are you... I, I am. I, I mean, that, that is accurate. I am a very serious person, but I'm probably not as serious as I look or, or, or people perceive me to be. Uh, you know, my close friends uh, know that. Uh, but but I do, but there are certain things I do take serious, really serious. I mean, what one of the things I do take serious is education. I do, I truly take that very, very seriously because I think that that is a key 
to, that is a key to life is to, is to inform yourself, to educate yourself. And it doesn't have to be, have to be just, just formal, although that's a part of it, but it's just, it's, it's assembling knowledge so that you can, um, so that you can have the life that you want or that you can have a good life that requires you to assemble knowledge and to use that knowledge as you go forward. So for me, that's one of those serious things, you know, um, and it's one of those things like vegetables to kids, right? Uh, you let, if you let your children eat, you know, honey and donuts and sweets all, all, all the time, you know, five-year-old will do that, right? But they don't know that they should eat vegetables, right? As part of like education, a lot of times the education component, um, we are, especially in elementary school and high school, we're, we're, we're pushed to do things we don't necessarily understand at the time, right? But folks like myself and other educators, they're serious about you learning those things because they know that, yeah, you don't take it serious now, it's not important to you now, but we know that at some point it's going to be important, right? So it's one of those serious things. So for me, I am a ser serious person, less so than I look. Uh, but there you are do, things you do like, laugh, you do listen to music, you go to oh, concerts, absolutely. and you absolutely. know how to have, you know how to relax and enjoy yourself, right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Dean Collins, there have been you know this is this conversation of obviously is not about Chicago State. This is about you, but I want to note uh, you've been the dean uh, at Chicago State. Um, it seems like through it all, uh, you've been there. Mm -hmm. What? Um, would you say has, has kind of kept you um, uh, uh, insulated from all of the changes over the years? What is working for you as the Dean of the College of Business at Chicago State University? You can, and, and I say that because I would imagine, I don't know this for sure, but mm -hmm. I would imagine you could have jump ship, you could have gone to Howard, you could have gone to Northwestern, you could have gone to any of these Ivy Leagues, PWIs, or even more affluent uh, HBCUs, but you haven't. What is working for you over there at Chicago State? Well, for me, it, it's the mission, man. It really, it truly is the mission. It truly is the mission. And the, the mission is very similar to most, uh, the missions of most HBCUs. You know, Chicago State is not technically an HBCU because historically it was founded as a teacher's college. Uh, for Polish immigrants, actually, but over the over a period of time, it's become a, a PBI or predominantly black institution, which puts us in the same category with HBCUs, if you will, in the current day. Um, so for me, it's the mission of educating and uplifting um, students of color to provide a pathway to uh, the American life, which requires, if uh, for for most folks. Um, to do really well, um, that college degree or degrees is something that's required. And the HBCUs have, including the Chicago State, which is a PBI, have provided that pathway. It's that, it's that mission of educating and uplifting Black folk. That's what kept me. I mean, that's folk, a lot of folks ask me, quite a, quite a few people ask me, why did you ever leave Kellogg with all those resources, beautiful, absolutely beautiful campus and the like. And it was simple. It was just that the mission of being able to assist and help more students that look like me was the reason I came to CSU and stayed at CSU. That's awesome. That's awesome. There have been lots of changes in education over the years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how education is disseminated mm -hmm. and how education is received. Yes. Right? You've noticed, witnessed, bear witness to some of the changes in students. Yeah. How have students changed since you've been in higher ed, since you've been in post-secondary, to this time that we're marking as the post-pandemic era? How have students changed and evolved from your perspective? Mm, that's a great question, Stu. Great question. Um, I think the biggest change that I've noticed uh, is that, now I don't want to sound like a grumpy old man, but maybe I am. <laughs> but I think I've noticed that 
the students of today um, are a, want a little bit more immediate uh, gratification, a little bit gratification, a little bit quicker, um, and. I believe that in the past, there was a bit more focus on the uh, post-college years. What, what happens after you graduate? I think the biggest difference is that, from my perspective, is that today's students, we don't have as many that look, as they're going through their college years, are looking beyond in terms of a plan or what they want to do. Uh, to their career, to their career phase. And therefore, a lot of opportunities, absolutely fabulous opportunities that come their way while they're in school, go right past them because um, they're not as focused on that. Um, and so it requires a bit more encouragement, a bit more um, intervention on our part to help the students to focus on that post uh, post school years to the to the career stage. Are you finding and and um, I'm not going to be as as uh, technical in this question. Meaning, I'm just going to just dive right into this question. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that students are coming into college more or less prepared to succeed at the post secondary level? I think in general, uh, less prepared. And it, this, this is not just, just to be really clear, this is not just um, uh, Black students. This is uh, the all students. Or, yeah, we're talking or just students. In, I'm, I'm, yeah, in general, students. In general, right, right, right. are coming in less prepared. And the, the preparation, I mean, is one of, is two things. Is one of kind of, um, of, of, of certain skill sets in terms, of, for example, one of the key things that we all educators, uh, most college educators kind of uh, complain about is, uh, the writing skills. Um, uh, I think that it has something to do directly with, I think directly with um, the way that we communicate in today's world. If students today communicate in, in general terms, you know, with, with their phones, the tablets, in very short snippets, you know, uh, fractions of sentences, uh, as opposed to uh, complete sentences, right? And so that, that ha over time, you do that thousands and thousands of times, that has an effect in your in your in your in your in your, in your uh, formal writing, uh, so I think it that skill set. However, from the technical side, the skill set, you know, in terms of of being able to navigate uh, computer operating system and, and use technology to advance yourself, clearly prepared, clearly advanced, right? But some of those basic skills kind of get short shrift. Uh, and then the other part, I think, in terms of preparation, is just again attitudinally, attitudinally being again where you are really focused on the purpose of why you're in school. That the, why are you here? And then other than just to achieve the degree, what do you wanna do with it? I think in general, uh, there's, there's not as much focus as they I think should be on that again, that, 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 that career phase, that after college phase. So that, that so the preparation in terms of some skills, particularly writing, and then the uh, the attitudinal approach to uh, to college. And I want to make sure that you know we're we're not positioning this as a as a blaming or a finger pointing right. at, no. at at the high school level. You know we're making no. observations, and you know you and because it's making we have, it's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a different day. It's a different day. I'm sure that if I really think about it hard enough, there's some. Uh, you know, in my generation, when we were in school, there are some deficiencies that are different then that are different now. So I just think it's a different time. So we just have to approach the challenges uh, that are presented to us by this by this this era. Uh, and those challenges are, uh, in many cases, I think, are um, are connected to uh, the way our lifestyle, which has changed. Uh, the way the culture has shifted, um, and so it's just a different. It's just a different set of challenges. I don't. I don't want to say it's to your point. We're not bashing. It's not right. saying if the kids today are somehow um, less than. Absolutely right. not. It's just a different time. Yeah, educators. From my research and experience, educators, decade after decade, have always, you know, made an issue of 
um, the younger generation's writing skills. That's always been a complaint. And, you know, I can understand that. I can see that. Um, and I can also see how in this generation, particularly we're talking specifically millennials and younger, yes. um, mm -hmm. I can see how they have abbreviated some of the you know grammar and the mm -hmm. written language, but I would I would I offer up that they are probably more analytical and more in depth than the actual words that they use, whether it's oral or whether it's written. I believe that they are deeper thinkers than past generations. Is just from my experience. I would, I would, I would tend to agree with you. I would tend to agree with you. I, th I think if you look at the culture, I, I would just in general, we have become. If you look, at, you compare. Just let's go a few. If you compare the the the, the 50s and 60s uh, to today, right? At that point in time, in general, the culture was more formal. One of the things I used to I used to love look at is the old photographs, historical photographs. Like, look at a look at a baseball game from the 1950s and 60s. People were there in ties and hats. You know, right. <laughs> you know, people, half the people in the stadium had on ties. So it, it was just a more formal time. So when people sure. spoke, they spoke more formally. As as the years progressed, we got to the 60s and the 70s and 80s, things become more formal, not only in the way we dress, but the way we talk. Way we interacted, so it's just a it's a kind of a cultural shift that manifests itself. But to your point, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are, are, are thinking in a shallow manner. It's just that we are we just kind of interacting a different way. Absolutely, I'm glad that you brought that up. You know, Russell Simmons has long been one of my my professional idols, um, and early well, mid to late '80s for me. Um, and part of that was him kind of rebuking the establishment by going into corporate, not wearing suits. Um, later, he, you know, got with it, you know, and, 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 and I think about some of the other people that I kind of look up to, like, uh, you know, Sean Carter, also known as Jay-Z, mm -hmm. who initially started off with that same path. But now you see him, you know, he's always for the, you know, for the most part, pretty, pretty dressed up. Um, yes. So let's let's talk a little bit about technology and education as it relates to the classroom setting. First of all, are you all back in person, full time in person or are you? We're, we're back. Yeah, we're back. We're back in person. Yes, sir. And from my experience, I remember you all, Chicago State, had always embraced a flipped classroom a, mm -hmm. a e-learning, a virtual learning classroom and bot environment. Yes, yeah, yes. Students today, Dean Collins, have much more access to information than ever before. I had to go to the library to go look up an encyclopedia. <laughs> I'm not sure what your experience was in high school doing research papers. Yeah, same but today, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but today, you know, we can Google information you have a question on the spot, you can get some semblance yes. of an answer. Yes. How is that affecting? Well, are, are, the, are, are students using the technology to that advantage? Is it affecting how um, your professors and faculty are verifying the information? Is it making them become better or is it becoming more contentious in the classroom? No, I actually think that the technology has actually been helpful. Um, uh, because now you have different modes and ways to engage the student as well as assist. So, for example, right now, um, uh, if, you, if you're teaching a class, even if it's not an online class, let's just say it's a regular face-to-face -face class, but with technology, uh, our um, uh, learning system, I can post uh, in a PDF format files. I can post information that students can go and, and obtain. The student doesn't necessarily have to be in the classroom to actually receive this piece of paper, right? I can now post that, that article or that, or that chapter or that information online. I can interact with that student online. I can, I can, I can uh, have the, the grades online and visible all the time. 
So, uh, so there, so even if I'm just teaching in a face-to-face -face manner, I can use technology to my advantage. In the classroom, I can use, I have the, the, uh, the advantage of a uh, audio visual system. Not only can I do a PowerPoint presentation, I can actually pull out my my tablet and then connect it to the uh, to the system and write on my tablet and shows on the screen. Uh, I can then shift over and and go to the internet and bring up a video or an information and show the students in real time. So there, so I think in technology has a lot of advantages that we bring to the classroom um, that provides a actually superior. Uh, in my estimation, superior experience for today's student than than uh, than uh, than I had than when I was in college. Yeah, that's that's absolutely phenomenal. Dean Collins, I'd like for you to uh, address um, um, elementary school leaders, high school leaders. What would you offer? What would you ask of them that they may want to put into their toolkit? to better prepare their students for higher ed learning? I think the, I think in general, one of the single biggest things that could be done with younger students as they kind of prepare in the elementary and high school, especially high school, especially, is to hold the students accountable. Stu so the students come in expecting to be held accountable for their work. And uh, we tend to run across every now and again, and more so than I would have imagined, um, students that um, are looking for, it's one thing to look for help and assistance. It's another thing for you to want it to be simple and easy. And expect it to be simple and easy. I think that, I think, providing a bit more rigor in whatever you're teaching and a, a, little, a little bit more tough love in terms of expectations for student performance. Um, uh, I, I think sometimes what we, what we tend to, I, I don't want to be presumptuous, uh, but on on my end of the, of the, of the, of the, of the system, I can't, I can't, I truly can't speak and I don't want to uh, pretend like I'm speaking for folks in the high school. I have not taught the high school level. Uh, but when we receive the student, it seems to me that in some cases, there's not as much rigor from those instructors. So when they run across a tough instructor, right? Uh, a lot of folks just can't, they can't deal with it. It's just, it's just tough for them, right? But to me, if you come into college, you should almost expect that. You usually almost, when, when we went to college, we expected that, oh, we were, you know, that first, most freshmen are typically nervous, scared that for you don't know what to expect. Uh, but you kind of prepared yourself to expect this is gonna be tough. <laughs> and, and to go into it believing or understanding it's going to be tough and not expecting it to be easy. I think that uh, helping students to feel or think that and understand that when they go to school, especially college, that they have to take on a bit more responsibility for their own education. That's one of the biggest things, one of the biggest, biggest lessons I learned when I was my, fresh, my freshman year in college is that the biggest, for me, the biggest change was that in high school, the, the, the instructors really worked to help teach you and in college, what I really quickly found out is that instructors give you the information and guide you, but you have to go back and almost teach yourself. You have to put that kind of level of dedication to informing yourself so that when you get to the classroom, that classroom there is really more for guidance, information gathering, but you have, but the hard work you put in is, is, is intentionally trying to have the attitude of almost instructing yourself and in getting this information so that I can truly learn. I'm not expecting for that 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 instruction just to pour the information into my head, but that it providing me the guiding posts, the guideposts where I can then help to almost gather information 
and teach myself. I don't expect them to teach themselves, but I expect them to be able to put more effort in the learning process, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, I, um, and I understand that. And, and I, having taught at the post-secondary in the past, I understand that I'm trying to get students to take ownership of their, their learning. So yes. here's the information. The practice, we come in here to practice applying yeah. the, the theory. Let's, yes. let's, let's, let's apply it so you can be prepared. Having said that, there are two more questions that I want to kind of get out mm -hmm. before we get out of here. Um, applying the theory. Mm -hmm. I am on record. I have a master's degree. I am on record having taught at post-secondary. Mm -hmm. I am on record saying to students, you don't need college to succeed. Correct. What, when we think about the future of work and all this technology, you got big tech companies that are, you know, Google saying, hey, come here, we'll get you trained up. We'll get you trained up. What are you saying to those students who are now saying, uh, I'm not going to go to college. Mm -hmm. I say that what you're doing is that you're, you're making your, your life riskier by doing that. You do not need college to succeed. You absolutely do not. Absolutely do not. However, you limit your options when you don't do that. Right. You can go to, a, you know, a Google or any other uh, company that say they will train you up. Uh, you don't necessarily need that. That's true. Uh, and what happens if that particular company goes away or, you know, uh, you separate from that company? Then what? You're gonna, is there another company that's going to have that same attitude? Maybe, maybe not. If with the education, uh, you have more options in that scenario versus not having the education. So the education piece just gives you a lot more options and reduces the risk of you being able to succeed in whatever you want to do. Yeah, it's like people with money always say money ain't important. Well, when you, <laughs> <laughs> money ain't that important. Well, when you got it, it, it gets that's away. right. That's, you know, and most exactly. people, people with the degrees who can who are either employable or who can find work or say, ah, oh, you don't need to go to, you know, yeah, well, you are already straight. So you're, exactly. Right. exactly. It's, a different, it's a different world if you if you got, you know, you know, three kids and two bedrooms and you know, mm -hmm. one job. That's you right. It, money becomes a little bit different then. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, let's let's address the six hundred pound gorilla in the room, the cost of education. Yes. The cost of oh. education compared to me, you know, there are a lot of independent educators out here who are unaccredited offering classes in business and classes in coaching and start your business here, pay me $1,000, pay me $3,000, get your business off the ground versus, and I'm sure programs even like Harvard <clears throat> Business School and Kellogg and yes, Chicago yes. State College of Business are filling some of that. What's your response to the cost of education in the face of all of this microeducation that's happening out here in the tech space? Well, I would say that the, let me just quickly say the microeducation credentials, I think, uh, does provide uh, some alternatives uh, for education. I, I still think it, it, it even though it, it's definitely, definitely better than no education, but it does still, uh, in a similar bucket to having no education, it, it kind of increases your risk when you don't have that formalized degree from a credit institution. The credit institution degree as a undergraduate or a graduate just gives you more options. The, the, the specialized skill sets, great, right? That gives you great in that particular field. But then if you ever want to shift away from that field a little bit, uh, then that requires another certification. Whereas the, 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 the bachelor's and the master's are a little bit more, bro, uh, broader and provides you more opportunities. But having said that, so I, I, don't, I don't 
I don't quibble with the the micro credentials. I think in a lot of instances it makes a lot of sense. Um, but when it comes to education in general in terms of cost, I think that that is one of the single biggest challenges and risks to American society as a whole, honestly. If we think about, and here's why I say that, I think that the cost of education, especially college education has got so expensive, we are now re-bifurcating society. This is what I mean by that. Before World War mm, II, mm, mm -hmm. before World War II, before you know, really any sort of real assistance for students going to school, the only way you went to school was your family had enough money to send you to school. You either had the money or you didn't, that's it. Mm. After World War II in the GI Bill, which was established for uh, World War II veterans, that GI Bill sent a whole host of people to college, you know? And that was what created, you know, this great expansion of the middle class in the, uh, the 50s and 60s. Right. And then by that time, that's when government stepped up. You had more programs to assist people with college education. So so from about the, the, the 50s and 60s and 70s and even early part of 80s, you could pretty much go to school. Almost any school that your brain was smart enough to take you to there, because there was enough resources in terms of scholarships, grants and the like. Uh, if there was, it wasn't enough there, you could work a part-time job and put yourself through school. I literally, my, my college education, uh, a semester of school, no, a year of school, cost me roughly, on campus, cost me roughly somewhere between three and $4,000. So you could oh, go right. to school, have a part-time job and put yourself through school. Today's education, right? You know, uh, average college, you know, you're talking about kind of median level uh, costs. You're talking about 20 to 30 yeah. grand. Yeah, just at a basic you can't, level. Where, you, where yeah. do you find a part-time job where you can take part-time money and pay 30 grand? It doesn't right. exist. So right. what's happening is, as we know, there are certain schools these are the, the most expensive schools, there are certain opportunities that only go to those students in those schools. So if you're not able to afford 30, 40, 50 grand a year, you won't see those opportunities. Therefore, you start to see slowly this kind of re-bifurcation of society to the haves and the have-nots on the basis of the cost of the education alone. And, and, and I think that is one of the major things that has to be addressed in this society, because we are literally pricing people out of opportunities. Uh, because we know, and it's always gonna be the case, there's certain opportunities that go to certain schools, period. And so if you want those opportunities, you have to be able to afford it, and how do you afford it? That's heavy. That's heavy that you talk about that. I talk about the, the haves and the have nots are reemerging like never before again today. Yes. Uh, I talk about it from the perspective of access to technology yes. versus those who have access to technology yes. versus those that don't. I'm, I'm learning a lot more about Web 3.0, which is this yes. metaverse and blockchain version of the Internet and the, and the web, mm -hmm. uh, the World Wide Web. Yes. And uh, if you if you are not adept to blockchain technology or coding, right. um, there's a you, there there are a lot of people that are going to be left behind from that wealth transfer. Yes, yes. Um, that is, that I think we're happening, uh, uh, that we're witnessing, that we're a part of right now. Uh, we've covered a lot of things at a at a surface level. We we dug in a little bit on a few things. In mm -hmm. this very, very short, expansive conversation. Any final thoughts you want to leave with listeners who are, you know, your peers, my peers yeah. in yes. education, their parents, their teachers, their principals, their network chiefs, 
that are listening. I would say, yeah, the, 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 I guess my final thought would be this, and that is that to the extent that the folks who listen to your podcast uh, have any influence, at, especially, especially I think I would say at the high school level, uh, is that we as a society really have to address and I would say fix our educational system uh, such that students are coming out of school with real knowledge. I think a lot of the upheaval and turmoil that we've seen in society for the last several years, to me, is a direct correlation to a lack of knowledge, to a lack of education. And, and, and the only way that that gets fixed is if you educate that populace. Uh, because the populace right now, we have too many people that believe things that are illogical. And that's the direct, direct link to not being properly educated. And we have to fix that or we are in danger. I'd love to be able to bring you back to kind of dig in just even on that piece. People who are believing the illogical uh, my right. brain starts to go when I think about that and how valuations are created uh, yes. when we start talking about business. And I know that's your, yes. your lane. Um, fat, last question for me, if you could, and I'm, I am purposefully putting you on the spot, describe okay. the college classroom 20 years from now. Whoa, college classroom 20 years from now. Hmm. I what think does that be, look like? Yeah, what does yeah. that look like? I think the college classroom is from 20 years from now is going to be uh, more interactive and is going to engage and connect with um, the outside world in a much more um, uh, efficient and almost seamless fashion. We are going to be able to provide, we're going to be able to provide much more direct expression of the theory that you're teaching in class and being able to connect with um, uh, the effects of that theory in real time and in, in, by engaging the outside world in a better fashion. I actually, I'm glad you said that. I was thinking the same thing. And the, the one word that comes to my mind is um, immersive simulation. There you go. I, I think you're right. Immersive I think, simulation. I think it could be something like that. Yeah. I think yeah. it's going to be very, very close. Uh, it's going to be much mm -hmm. easier. Technology is going to afford us to be able to do that. Yeah. And I could see the CEOs being able to, through some, you know, we have projections and all that. We can do Zooms and stuff like this now. You know, maybe we'll get a, you know, a hologram of Dean Collins will be in the classroom. Yeah. And, and across the country or across the world or something like that. Yeah, I, I think I think that very soon, I, I, don't, I don't know what the timeline is, but I think I think very soon, I think you mentioned hologram. I think hologram is going to be a game changer. I think hologram holograms, I'm still waiting on the holograms for, you know, uh, home use where you're going to be watching a movie via hologram. You can bring you can bring that into a classroom. That's a different level of engagement there. I'm definitely waiting on the uh, Wu Tang concert hologram in my <laughs> living room, man. I'm waiting on it. There and you I'm go. Sure you'll be waiting on the whispers of some hologram in your living well, you room know, or something. Well, I, I want to see. I want to see Wu Tang too. They nothing to mess okay, with. Okay, my man. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Collins, it has been a pleasure to have you on this episode of Dope People. You are dope. I appreciate you. I am glad to have you in my network. It has been an honor, and I look forward to you being back on this show in the new season. Thank you, Stu. Enjoyed it, sir. I'd love to come back. Thank you. You already know what it is. Until next time, peace. <laughs>